this conference, the Second World War through Anglo-Polish eyes encapsulates the ethos of the Anglo-Polish cultural exchange. What is the Anglo-Polish cultural exchange? It's a public programming forum which um, is a little bit in the spirit of the Monty Python sketch What have the Poles ever done for us? Uh, we, um, we seek to illuminate contributions to mainstream British culture and society made by people of Polish heritage over the past 200 years. This event is supported by the Polish Cultural Institute second year in a row. We are very happy to partner with, with the organizers. Uh, we feel that this is the kind of event that fulfills uh, exactly uh, what our mission here in London in the United Kingdom is all about. What path led you towards the Polish story? I walked around my sixth form with a solidarity badge on and got told to take it off. And my history teacher came up later and said, but put it back on afterwards. And we had a really great chat about it. I mean, there was obviously at that time, there was a lot of interest. I ended up um, gravitating towards uh, Polish history through Norman Davis. Again, very familiar to everyone in this room. Um, I'm looking at Andrzej Suchis, because Andrzej is another one of Norman's boys, as, uh, as, Norm, as Norman calls us. I knew, as many people who have had some connection with Bletchley Park did, that the Poles had somehow been involved in the Enigma story, and I went to find out what that was. Go to the bookstore, bookshops, go to Amazon. Nothing. The Poles have been whitewashed out of the entire story. So, what my book is about is about the origins of the Enigma code-breaking effort, uh, the astonishing discovery by Marian Rievsky that he could use mathematical equations to figure out the wiring of a machine he had never seen, and how the fruits of that discovery, which obviously translated into the ability of Polish military intelligence to read German Enigma messages in the years leading up to the outbreak of World War II, how that technology and that information, that know-how, came to be shared with the French and British uh, military authorities just at the point when the war was about to break over people's heads. We've been working for a number of months to pull together this two-day conference, um, examining aspects of Anglo-Polish culture and heritage within the context of the Second World War. And we are also trying to create an interdisciplinary perspective, not only with straightforward history, but also with people's history, with cultural memory, with the visual arts, with film, with personal testimonies, uh, involving the representatives of archives, museums, galleries to create a network of contacts for future endeavours. It's quite interesting looking at our collection. Most of you, the, the poles in our collection come into it around the time of the Second World War. Many were emigres. So we have a portrait um, of H.G. Wells by Felix Topolsky and then we have the self-portrait of Henrik um, Gottlieb who was a Polish Expressionist art, uh, artist who was part of the Formist um, group, came to Britain and he was associated with the London um, group. In part, um, we decided to focus on the Second World War specifically because we're working in tandem with the University of Oxford's Finest Hour project where they are collecting um, family memories of the Second World War and being of Polish heritage myself, I thought it was important that there was a Polish presence within that permanent archive. But we've also been talking about um, this idea that so many Polish families owe their, their presence in the UK um, and their identity has been shaped by the Second World War. Um, and there's been a sort of divergence in cultural memory um, of, of the sort of the British and the Polish, and there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of grievance. And one of the aspects we wanted to look at was certainly in the early war, the amount of cooperation and collaboration between British and Poles, both as individuals and institutionally. Um, so we've got this very broad programme looking at everything from the visual arts um, and, and radio through to looking at sort of military intelligence and liaison. What I wanted to say was that I finally 
summed up a great deal of what I felt and heard and known in a novel which I wrote about four years ago now. It's called The Death of the Fronsac. And it's about events in Greenock. And it's about a young Polish officer who finds himself there. Uh, and what he thinks is happening to his country, to himself. Uh, what he thinks about Scotland. Uh, and what awful mistakes he makes finally, which gets him into just terrible trouble. And he goes back to Poland at just about the wrong moment and he gets into even worse trouble there in the Stalinist period. I think there's a natural audience for events such as this, which is particularly people like my mother's generation, which are people that were either born um, during the war or in the sort of 1950s. And we're looking at how their parents' experiences in the war um, shaped them as people. And we're looking at how they sort of navigated issues of identity, assimilating into British culture, what aspects of Polish culture to cherish. Um, so in that perspective, it's a sort of generational interest. But we're very much looking, the Second World War was a formative experience for so many families. Um, it should be of interest to, to my generation um, in particular. And maybe it's a natural consequence of assimilation and time um, that it perhaps has less interest um, for that group but um, it's, it's certainly I think that interest in heritage is something that should be important to everybody. This project focused on the ageing legacy of Poland's exiled emigre who remained in Britain after the Second World War and while the stories do not age the people who tell them do. Now the fact that all three people you see on the screen today are no longer with us for me as a reflection on these narrowing windows of opportunity that we have to record the personal accounts that bear witness to Poland's turbulent modern history and the relevance that these stories have in the world today. So I was saying that something really exciting happened during the Second World War and it, it was a cultural explosion in visual print culture. This is a little brochure that was published at the time which aligned the idea of printing with propaganda, but also with social progress. The idea is to, uh, to reach uh, the widest spectrum of, 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 of the British public, including the Polish emigre community within it. So we want to create content for everybody. We want uh, for the Anglo-Polish organizations to look outwards, not to be looking inwards, not to be catering solely for themselves, but to find a way of engaging the general public with Polish culture and with our shared Anglo-Polish heritage. And we are catering for a multi-generational, uh, diverse audience of Britons, Poles, Anglo-Poles and the whole spectrum. Uh, Jenny said that we are of Polish heritage. I'm not. I'm Polish. I'm not of Polish heritage. Even though I was born in England, I am Polish. Um, and I think that that's something which our parents tried to instill us in, in us. If you want to spot the difference between a second generation Pole and our Polish cousins, here's a quick and secret guide. Poles from Poland seeking is an optional and strange habit. <laughs> Second gens conform to the British orderly queuing practice, even when in Poland. Conversely, when our Polish cousins inexplicably stand at the curb, immobile until a green man appears, we definitely dodge the oncoming traffic, believing the colour of the lights is merely a polite suggestion. <laughs> Five. Many of us were in Polish scouts or in Polish folk groups, so we know all the verses of the songs sung around campfires, and the Christmas carols, while well, our Polish cousins were bemused that there were any other verses available. <laughs> On the other hand, though, we only know the words of the first verse of the Polish national anthem and fall into an embarrassing silence as the singing continues. <laughs> six, six, the incredible stories from our parents and grandparents surrounded us and became the foundation of our lives, the structure of ourselves. For our Polish cousins, these stories are often new and fascinating discoveries of their own Polish history. My father did end up in the Gulag when, when the Russians uh, took his part of Poland, but that's a whole other story. Um, he came to the UK having met a British woman 
uh, in a third country. Once again, I'm not going to go into this detail. So my mum was not from that background. She was very English from you know, rural England. Um, he had no greater pleasure than Sunday lunch at Ognisko. Oh. And he would... So a big part of our life as kids was going there for Sunday lunch and having pierogi and kasha. But, but that's the main uh, thing I think I can bring to this conversation, is, is that although he did have, uh, shall we say, conflicted attitudes in some ways because of what had happened in Poland in the 30s with Jewish people, um, he retained a love of the culture through language and food. I'm particularly interested in a number of panels. Uh, we have Anglo-Polish um, writers. Uh, we have Neil Asherson, who's been writing on Polish matters for, for, for decades. Uh, we've got Roger Morehouse, Claire Mullin, Dermot Turing, all talking about sharing the Polish experience um, with a British audience and the challenges that that involves. And I'm going to be chairing um, a panel called Growing Up Polish, looking specifically at issues of Polish heritage, um, again, among people um, in the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, and how they are so directly shaped by, by the Second World War. But what we also have to remember that we were, and we should be proud of us Poles being successfully integrated into this society. It was a vision by Professor Roman Wajda, who realised that Poland community needed an, a centre, an institutional centre, and what he did was, the initial driving force was because the then uh, Labour government under Harold Wilson wanted to essentially disperse the Polish libraries. And he wanted, uh, that's Roman, the private, wanted the exact opposite. So what he did was he put them into what would be one building, POSC. We very much hope that this festival uh, is not going to be just a be-all and end-all event. Uh, we want to use it as a springboard to bring people together and to connect networks, interpersonal, academic, professional, organizational, which will serve as a resource for joining forces for future endeavors. The message that this festival brings across is that the potential for um, further research, for further um, studies, um, events, books, publications, uh, even movies, is almost uh, almost um, infinite. Uh, the only thing that limits us is our um, uh, intelligence, our creativity, uh, sometimes unfortunately also funding, but when it comes to dedication of the people who are uh, uh, featured in, in the agenda of, of the festival, I think it's, it's really encouraging and as, as the director of the institute I feel very, very encouraged as far as the future of the research into Polish heritage in the United Kingdom is concerned. Thank you.